I'm uh, Cornell Clayton. I'm director of the Foley Institute. And on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out to our event today. Before I introduce our speaker, I just want to uh, let you know we have two remaining events this semester after the break. The first is on November 29th at 3 o'clock here in the Institute. We'll have Bob Ferguson, the Attorney General of the State of Washington. He'll be talking about uh, his uh, legal suits against the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that should be a good discussion. I encourage you to come to that. And then on December 5th at noon here in the Institute, we'll have our annual um, uh, legislative uh, preview uh, with our local district uh, nine representatives. So that will be at noon on December 9th. So now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker today, Stephen Steer. Stephen's an old friend and colleague of mine in the Department of Public uh, in, uh, Politics, Philosophy, and Public Affairs. He's the Sam Reed Professor of Civility and Civic Education, which is a professorship also lodged here in the Institute. He's currently also the director of the School of Pu uh, Politics, Public Affairs, or Philosophy and Public Affairs. It's a mouthful every time I have to say that. <laughs> Uh, and then he's also recently been uh, named as one of our Foley Public Affairs Speakers Fellows. We've uh, starting a new partnership with Humanities Washington. Begins uh, over the next well, next two years we'll be doing this, uh, where we are providing uh, Humanities Washington Speakers Bureau five different public affairs speakers, and they will travel around the state and give uh, lectures. And so. We've invited each of those fellows to come and do a presentation here at the Institute before they go around the state and give theirs. And so that's what Stephen's going to be presenting to us today. The topic uh, that he'll be addressing is, is truth really dead in America? So join me now in welcoming Stephen Steer. Well, thank you, Cornell. And thank you, everyone, for, uh, for coming out today. Um, if you've been paying attention to uh, uh, political news in the last couple of years, you've probably heard some phrases like alternative facts and fake news and some general discussions about the status of, of facts and, and science in our world. And so I want to talk a little bit about uh, my perspective on uh, these, uh, the, these uh, trends. Um, most contemporary uh, people uh, that, that start talking about uh, this post-truth world uh, generally trace it back to a comment that was made by Karl Rove, uh, who was a senior advisor uh, to President George Bush back in 2004, uh, when he said to a group of journalists um, that uh, they were part of the reality-based community, uh, which, by the way, I think would be a great name for a band, uh, the reality-based community, um, and that that's not the way the world works anymore, uh, that there, there aren't objective facts that, uh, that we can all agree upon. Uh, less than a year later, uh, Stephen Colbert, in his very first uh, episode of his brand new program at the time, The Colbert Report, uh, introduced a segment called The Word. And the very first word, as you might remember, was truthiness. And truthiness, uh, according to Stephen Col uh, Colbert, uh, was truth that comes from the gut, not from books, uh, or facts that one wishes to be true that are not necessarily objectively true. Uh, and just to show how um, uh, forward-thinking Ronald Reagan was, some of you of a certain age will remember the <laughs> Iran-Contra scandal uh, back in the 80s. And Ronald Reagan, when he got caught with the goods, uh, had to finally say, uh, I told you that I did not train my arms for hostages, and my heart tells me that's true, but the facts and evidence tell me that it's, that it's not. Uh, if we fast forward just a little bit, uh, a couple years ago, uh, Post-Truth was named uh, the word of the year by the Oxford Dictionary. And following the theme, uh, Post-Truth relating to or denoting circumstances in which the facts are less influential than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Or as George Costanza said, it's not a lie uh, if you believe it. Uh, and so we're following that thread. Uh, well, this, of course, has set off a, uh, a, a, a large number of books uh, as I say here, the death of truth is running neck and neck with the death of democracy in literary circles. All of these <coughs> books that you're going to see have come out, well, virtually all of them have come out in the last year, uh, most of them in the last six months. And so we see um, uh, Machiko Kakutani and Tom Nichols' book. Uh, the Rand Institute uh, came out with a book with 
poorly named, I think, title, Truth Decay. Uh, Lee McIntyre, a philosopher, uh, has a book called Post Truth. Uh, the War on Science by Sean Otto, Gaslighting America by Amanda Carpenter, and she happens to be a conservative Republican. Even uh, the mainstream magazines have gotten into the act uh, by positing on their covers, is truth dead, is, is there a war on science, the art of the lie. Um, so there are some common themes uh, that run through the, this idea of post-truth politics. Uh, one is that there seems to be increasing disagreement about facts and analytical interpretations of data. And I'm actually going to show you some data that kind of demonstrates this point. And it's not just all based on partisanship either, uh, but uh, there's also disagreements between the lay people and so-called experts uh, on what is a fact and what is not. There's also been a blurring of the line between opinion and fact. I don't know about you, uh, but I consider myself a pretty good consumer of political news, and I have a really hard time when I'm watching uh, a cable news program trying to figure out what's opinion and what's being proffered as a fact. And so imagine how someone without a PhD in political science might, uh, might respond to that. There's also been an increasing relative volume of opinion to fact. I think part of this is because of the 24-7 news cycle. Um, news is very expensive to gather where opinion is very cheap. And so um, opinion is sort of overwhelming facts. And again, you don't have to watch too much cable TV to see the panels of usually equally divided Republicans and Democrats uh, shouting at each other. Uh, and then finally, uh, there certainly is a decline in, in trust in formerly respected sources of factual information. And so all of these trends, I think, are, are going on at this point in time. So how did we get here? Well, a fully formed explanation would have to go all the way back to the founding of the country. As Kurt Anderson, who some of you probably saw a couple of weeks ago, uh, points out in Fantasyland, uh, the founders of the country, or at least the initial um, uh, people who came over, were were Puritans, and the Puritans had a highly individualistic view of life and their relationship with, with God. Uh, layer on top of that, the constitutional designers uh, who were very influenced by the French Enlightenment. Uh, in fact, Richard Hofstadter calls them public or gentleman intellectuals. And so if you mash them up, uh, the Puritans and the Enlightenment folks together, uh, you get a situation where Americans have always um, sort of had a direct relationship or think they have a direct relationship with both God and with nature. Uh, and so um, that's sort of a, a long, the long game uh, explanation. But there's also some more uh, recent things that have happened, I think, uh, that put us in this kind of post-truth situation. Uh, back in the 1960s, again, some of you might remember, um, this is when postmodernism uh, in philosophy became uh, very popular. Uh, the idea of questioning authority, the New Age counterculture, all of these were do your own thing, find your own truth, uh, and it's sort of ironic that we're really sort of a, sort of a left-wing uh, trope as, as de developed into a uh, sort of a right-wing idea as well. Um, if you look back at the 80s and the 90s, uh, there were major transformations in the traditional media. I'm thinking here of the rise of talk radio after the Fairness Doctrine was struck down. Uh, I'm thinking of, of the rise of, of cable news. Um, as, as Austin Randi, a famous political scientist, once said, we transitioned from broadcasting to narrowcasting. Uh, I already mentioned the 24-7 news cycle. And so the traditional media certainly changed. Um, we could do a whole, and we have done whole separate uh, presentations on the increasing social and political polarization. I'm sure a learned group like this uh, has a pretty good handle on, on that. Um, and then, of course, the rise of social media, uh, which sort of you know, put the cap on the bottle. Uh, everybody has their own blogosphere, and they can only, if they, can, if they want, can, they can uh, tailor their messages to only things they want to hear uh, from other people that are like-minded. Now, I'm not going to let the American people off the hook either, because how Americans uh, uh, consume political news is somewhat problematic as well, as I'll show you here in a second. Um, so you may remember Pogo cartoon, We Have Met the Enemy and It Is Us. Uh, and so that's what I'm referring to here. Um, earlier this year, the Pew Research Center uh, did a really interesting study in which they asked a random sample of Americans. Uh, they gave them a list of factual statements and opinion statements and asked them if you can distinguish between the two. 
And uh, what, we'll, what, we, what we'll see here in a minute is, is, is sort of interesting on, uh, on, a, on a couple of levels. But I also want to make this maybe an audience participation. So as these statements come in, don't look at your neighbor, uh, but raise your hand uh, if you think each of these statements is a factual statement. Uh, well, I'll ask you if, if, you, if you think it's a factual opinion. So the first statement <coughs> is immigrants who are in the U.S. illegally have some rights under the Constitution. Show of hands, how many think it's a factual statement? And how many think it's an opinion statement? Okay, it's a factual statement. Uh, they do have some rights under the Constitution. Um, a second question, increasing the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour is essential for the health of the U.S. economy. How many think that's a factual statement? Good for you. It's, a, it's definitely an opinion statement. I think the essential is the, the giveaway there. Abortion should be legal in most cases. I mean, that's a factual statement. Ah, you're on to him, right? <laughs> so, yeah, it's an opinion statement. Spending on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid make up the largest portion of the U.S. federal budget. Fact statement? Yeah, it's, it's a fact statement, certainly. Uh, over 70% of the federal budget. Uh, immigrants here in the U.S. illegally are a very big problem for the country today. Is that a fact statement? Opinion. It's opinion statement. And finally, Healthcare costs per person in the U.S. are the highest in the developed world. Fact statement? Yeah, it certainly, it certainly is. So, what did the random sample say? Well, here you go. Um, what's interesting about uh, this table, I think, is not just that Republicans and Democrats sort in ways that you would think they would sort, but also the relatively low percentage of people who got it right. Uh, that's sort of the hidden message here. And so, Spending on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, 54% uh, of the Democrats uh, said that that was a factual statement, where 63% of the Republicans uh, did. Very little difference between the partisans on, uh, on ISIS and health care costs. Everyone seems to know that. Um, in terms of immigrants uh, uh, having some rights, you can see only 43% of Republicans said that's a factual statement, uh, whereas 65% uh, of Democrats did. And then the question I didn't ask you is the last one. President Barack Obama was born in the United States. 63% uh, of Republicans <laughs> identified that as a factual statement, which means 37% say it's an opinion statement. Um, there's also separation uh, on, in terms of people misidentifying opinion statements as factual. Uh, there's that immigrants uh, are a big problem question. Uh, only 19% of Democrats said that that was a factual statement. Uh, whereas 50% of Republicans said that that was a factual statement in error. Um, of course, there is some, some closeness in terms of government is, is inefficient and, and democracy is the greatest form of government. Um, but there you can see the last one, increasing the federal minimum wage. Again, there's a sort of a understandable sort between the Republicans uh, saying <coughs> it's a factual statement when it's, when it's an opinion statement, or I'm sorry, opinion statement when it's factual, um, and only 17% of, of the Democrats. Um, in terms of the overall view of science and scientists, uh, the story is pretty good, I think. Uh, if you ask people uh, who they trust a lot, and I will, I will emphasize the a lot, um, because that makes it, doesn't make it look quite so bad for, for the scientists, um, in each of these different categories, biomedical, uh, I'm sorry, the health and benefits of, of vaccines, uh, climate change, um, uh, health of eating GMOs, gen genetically modified foods, you can see that scientists are trusted uh, in most cases far more uh, than, than other people uh, that might have uh, a claim on, on the truth. Uh, another interesting aspect though of, the, of a Pew study uh, is um, the opinion differences between regular people and members of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, so these are uh, largely PhDs and others who uh, would have some, uh, some expertise in their areas. Uh, I'll just point out a few of these. Uh, there's a large split in virtually all of them, but is it safe to eat gen genetically modified food? 37% of adults, uh, U.S. adults said that that was a, um, uh, saying that that's a true story, believe that's true, but 88% of the AAAS scientists did. Um, in terms of safety foods with, with pesticides, 28% of the public they agreed with that statement. 68% of the AAAS scientists uh, did. Um, climate change, 
uh, agreed that climate change is, is mostly due to human activity, whereas 87 percent of the AAAS scientists believe that. And so you can see on a wide variety of issues, there's a separation in the beliefs uh, on, on the, the, the veracity of science between the public and between AAAS scientists. Um, rather than insult on science, I, from my perspective, uh, I think you have to look more episodically at different policy debates uh, when you're looking at whether or not uh, people believe uh, what scientists are telling them or what knowledge tells us uh, versus what uh, they want to believe on their own. You know, one area, uh, criminal justice, we know that since 1993, uh, homicide rates been going down, violent crime in general has been going down. Uh, but beginning in 2000, according to Gallup, uh, people believe that crime is increasing. This is, I'm, I'm guessing, part of political messaging. Uh, people are being scared or being, they're trying to scare people by telling them that there's more crime uh, for political reasons, uh, not because it's actually true. And I put vaccines up here because it's, it's in the news a lot, but it's also an interesting case uh, because there isn't really good evidence that partisans or partisanship plays any role in whether or not you're more or less willing to vaccinate your child. Uh, what does, I mean, there's only slight amounts of, of evidence that um, younger women tend to uh, believe that vaccinations uh, are, are, are damaging to their children. Uh, there's also a certain amount of, if you, if you, the more knowledge you have about vaccines, the more likely you are to uh, say that they're a good thing. Um, but there doesn't seem to be any politics involved, despite what you hear in the media about you know, rich left-wing people uh, being disproportionately prone to not vaccinate their children. There are just an equal number of conservatives who don't want government telling them what to do, uh, and they may or may not vaccinate their children, even if it's mandatory. Um, some of you may remember a few years ago down in Portland, Oregon, uh, for the fourth time since 1960, the residents of Portland, uh, one of the most progressive cities in the country uh, by all measures, uh, for the fourth time voted down <coughs> overwhelmingly um, the chance to fluoridate their water. What's interesting about that is the main reason for fluoridation, the main argument that's made is, is an equity issue. Uh, poor children have less access to dental health care than rich children. And so that was the argument that was made uh, because there's overwhelming biomedical evidence that vaccinating uh, your water supply reduces the incidence of cavities, uh, that's not in any way harmful to people, but yet 64% of uh, Portland Oregonians voted, voted it down. And so Portland remains fluoride free. Um, there are a couple other points I want to make about what I call the use and misuse of science. Some of you may be familiar with an article by Dan Sarowitz, I know Matt is, because he's we've read it in seminars together. Uh, he makes a really interesting argument. Uh, and that argument is that science makes environmental problems, and by extension other problems, worse. And the reason he says this is because he says there's too much good science. Uh, and it's done from a variety of perspectives, uh, from different uh, methodological perspectives, from different fields. Um, and so uh, the bottom line is that if you've got a value position, you can probably find some science to back it up. Uh, and that makes, uh, according to Sarowitz, makes the problem worse uh, because you can, uh, you can support virtually any position. Um, another, what I would call, use and misuse of science is this idea that policy entrepreneurs can take advantage of both uncertainty in science and con conflict in values. Uh, to spin alternative narratives. This is very common. We've been studying this in political science since the 60s, uh, the symbolic use of narratives and numbers and other ways of portraying policy images in a way that is supportive of one position and uh, against another one. Uh, one of the better examples of this, and some of you may be familiar with both the book and the documentary film uh, that came out, Merchants of Doubt by Naomi Oreskes. Uh, what's interesting about the story of of how uh, a small group of very well-credentialed scientists uh, tried to tamp down uh, any regulations on tobacco use. Um, it wasn't based on, or, or climate change for that matter, it really wasn't based on them making more money. It was based on them believing that their value system were being, was being threatened. This is certainly true in, the term, in terms of climate change. Uh, they're against climate change because they don't want to 
you know, reduce the amount of meat in their diet. They don't want to drive cars that the government tells them they have to drive. And so um, it's a value-based argument as opposed to just a financial grab. Um, some of you are familiar with this story because it hits close to home. Uh, Rob Wilgus, uh, of course, ran the, the large predator center here at WSU, uh, recently separated from the university. And the New York Times Magazine did an article on him not too long ago uh, recounting uh, what happened in his case, which I think reduced to he was speaking truth to power, and he came up with some science that ran afoul of some of the state legislators. The state legislators then uh, pressured the university uh, to um, try to silence him, I guess is one way to put it. And uh, so he uh, got a payoff and, and left the uni university. But here's another example where science doesn't naturally filter right into uh, making decisions. There are other, uh, other things at work. Um, my own work has focused on how knowledge is utilized in different uh, policy debates. I look at how policy debates are structured, both in terms of consensus or dissensus on values and the extent to which there's consensus or dissensus on the knowledge base. And so this gives us like a more nuanced look at the role that knowledge plays in different policy debates. And I match these different dynamics of, of you know, structures of policy debates up with some well-established models of research utilization uh, that have been discovered out there in the literature. Uh, one of them, and this is sort of the, the default that I think most people, if you ask them what's the role of, of knowledge in policy, well, you, we find out some stuff and then we directly apply it uh, to a policy problem. And that's certainly the view of many uh, scientists that I've worked with, at least graduate student scientists, uh, who don't understand why if we tell them the right thing, they won't just apply it to the problem. And then we have to say, well, not everybody agrees that the end state is, that the same end state is what we're all shooting for. One example, I think, that exemplifies a case where this can happen, goes back to the 1970s. Uh, in 1976, uh, atmospheric researchers discovered that uh, there was a growing hole in the ozone layer. Uh, and I won't go into all the technical details of, of the ozone, but it's important, right? Um, uh, immediately, the uh, people studying public health linked uh, a, a shocking number uh, or potential shocking number of skin cancers if something isn't done uh, about uh, the, the ozone layer. Uh, it was discovered that chlorofluorocarbons, uh, this is the chemical that was in uh, Freon and other gases, um, maybe hairspray cans, um, and that was causing the, causing the problem. Well, with stunning speed, by 1978, uh, chlorofluorocarbons were, uh, were regulated uh, in the United States, and of course by 1985, the Montreal Protocol regulated them worldwide. And we're seeing evidence that the ozone uh, layer is, is, is healing itself uh, after this action. Well, what's interesting from, from my perspective is how quickly the science was directly applied to the problem. And part of the reason was, when you start framing things in terms of public health, uh, like your, the chance of getting skin cancer goes up by a factor of 20. That gets people's attention. And so, again, well, the way you frame the issue uh, has an impact on how politicians and others deal with it. There's also the fact that DuPont was the main producer of chlorofluorocarbons, didn't fight it at all. There were substitutes they had on hand, and so they didn't, they didn't push back uh, against that. Um, so there's at least one example. A lot of the other examples that I, that I could find are really kind of mundane ones. Uh, or the more like housekeeping uh, sorts of, of decisions that governments make. Um, another relationship, however, between um, policy and knowledge goes the other way. And this is the, I think, the Sarowitz uh, idea where uh, science gets weaponized by different uh, policy um, stakeholders. A really nice example, I think, is the debate that's been going on since the 60s uh, over whether to have uh, snowmobiles in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, it's very attractive to the outfitters in the cities and towns around Yellowstone because they get a lot more business in the winter. Uh, it brings more people to the park when they wouldn't necessarily be there. But of course, uh, snowmobiles uh, are very noisy. Uh, they also uh, create a lot of air pollution. In fact, 
Uh, there have been studies that show that on a busy weekend in Yellowstone, there's more air pollution in Yellowstone Park than there is in Los Angeles. Uh, and so what has happened, uh, the Park Service has kind of got caught in between. Um, and it kind of depends on who the president is. Republican presidents uh, have pushed to uh, allow, um, uh, allow snowmobiles, whereas Democratic presidents generally um, have wanted to outlaw them. And what happens is they end up in the courts. And then the courts uh, sort of uh, push forward the, forward the gridlock. Another example I won't go into details about is, is uh, the urban wildfire uh, situation, where people wanting to live and people wanting to, or, and local politicians wanting to increase their tax ba base uh, come into conflict with ecologists who tell us it's probably not a good idea to build in either floodplains or in uh, fire corridors uh, that we know are going to uh, burn. Uh, obviously, I took some of these examples because they're regional and they're going to resonate with the Humanities Washington sort of audience. Um, there's a, a third relationship here where knowledge and policy are more simpatico. Uh, I would call this the problem-solving model. Here we agree that something bad might happen if we uh, don't, for example, understand the behavior of hurricanes better, or in this other case, um, uh, understand the, the medical implications of using BPAs, uh, bisphenol A. Um, I think we're all in agreement that knowing more about hurricanes uh, rather than less is better, and knowing the medical implications of BPA is probably good as well. But what we don't have is really strong, sound science. Uh, this book, Storm World, by Chris Mooney is, is really interesting because he details the animosity between uh, meteorologists who base their, um, their models on data and climate modelers who use computers and, and large data sets uh, to make their predictions. And he says they're virtually at war with each other at the AMA con or the American Meteorological Association conference uh, each year. Similarly, uh, we aren't really clear, uh, and you can see the title, is it safe? Uh, we really aren't clear on what levels of bisphenol A are, are safe. Uh, just to be, uh, to be extra safe, we've, uh, we've of course outlawed them uh, in terms of lining baby bottles, uh, but they're still present in vegetables and fruits that you might have in your in your home. And then finally, there's a case, the fourth case is where there's a complete separation between knowledge and, and policy. Uh, the physicist Alvin, Alan Weinberg uh, coined a phrase, trans-science. Uh, in other words, issues that, that, that aren't amendable to science, uh, where no amount of science is going to convince somebody that their position uh, is wrong. Uh, and so there are uh, a number of, of these sorts of cases out there where um, we, we really can't rely on knowledge because the values uh, are, are uh, so deeply entrenched. You know, there's an optimistic way of looking at this separation as well. Uh, Carol um, Wolf, uh, about 30 years ago, wrote an article about the enlightenment function of science. And uh, so we might be able, if you want to be hopeful, say that there's knowledge floating around out there, uh, even if it's not directly attached to a problem, it might filter in at some point into, um, into the policy debates. So where do we go from here? Uh, well, like a, like a good academic, uh, I'm not going to come down on one side or the other. Uh, it's sort of like Schrodinger's cat, right? Truth is both dead and alive. Uh, and so um, there's, there's some reasons to be pessimistic uh, regarding post-truth politics. Uh, one reason to be pessimistic about it is it contributes certainly to the uh, already declining trust in important uh, civic institutions. Um, and so that is, most would agree is damaging to, uh, to democracy. It contributes to alienation and disengagement uh, of people from civic life. If we're shouting at each other without any shared basis of, of facts or knowledge, uh, it makes it that much harder uh, to be civil with each other. Um, certainly contributes to a decline in civil, uh, civil discourse, something I'm very interested in. Uh, it also, in a practical way, contributes to gridlock uh, and to ineffective policy making. And I think we're seeing the evidence of that um, in the last several Congresses. Uh, of course, at the extreme level, and you've probably seen this 
this George Orwell quotation in other venues. Uh, fun, fun story, I was going to use a different George Orwell quote that I found on the web. Um, I went back and looked. It wasn't something George Orwell actually ever said. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a fake quote. Uh, this, I did confirm. But it feels right. It feels this, right. Is, <laughs> this is actually on page 168 of 1984, of my edition of 1984. And so at the extreme level, you know, why, why are you believing your eyes uh, when you should believe what I'm telling you is basically the message there. Uh, but there's some also, I think, some reasons to be optimistic uh, about post-truth politics. Uh, one is, I think, it's pretty disputable that every day uh, we all rely on science, on technology, on, on experts uh, to um, navigate our daily lives. Um, you know, if I'm having dental surgery, I don't care what the politics of my surgeon are. I just wanted to be a good surgeon. Uh, and so, same is true with my pilot of my plane. I don't really care what they believe. I just care that they can do their job well. And so, I think there's plenty of evidence that we still rely uh, overwhelmingly on, on, on science and experts. Um, the marketplace of ideas, generally speaking, is also generally self-correcting in the long run. Uh, and so, again, it's a you know, hopeful idea that, that bad ideas will get pushed out by better and good ideas. Um, the free exchange of ideas is generally healthy uh, in a democracy. Uh, even if you disagree with what someone's saying, um, getting all the ideas out there is probably a good idea. There's also quite a bit of increase in what we call naming and shaming, right? PolitiFact, uh, all sorts of, there's 161 fact checkers that have been created in the last five years. And so increasingly they're making it harder and harder uh, for people to get away uh, with, with obvious untruths. Um, a recent book that I read, and I know Cornell read it too, uh, by Steven Pinker, and I, I highly recommend it. It's, it's full of interesting uh, tables and so forth, but his bottom line is that there's a substantial evidence uh, that progress based on science uh, has improved the human condition immensely, not just in Western countries, but actually more pointedly in uh, lesser developed countries as well. And so there's a lot of evidence that science and, and knowledge have, have served this role to as well. And I'll just end it, since I'm a uh, went to Cal Berkeley, and their their motto is "Let there be light, fiat lux." I will end with uh, with that. So let there be light. Okay. So, uh, so we have about 20, 25 minutes for some Q and A. Maybe I'll start us off. So, in terms of politics, clearly one of the biggest problems is there's been an erosion in the norm. Politicians would pay a cost if they blatantly lie, or they blatantly say things are actually inaccurate. And that's no longer the case. And they get away with it. So, so how do you combat that? And it seems unlikely that fact-checking, which has taken off, is uh, up to the task of rebuilding that kind of a norm. So, so what are your thoughts about how you rebuild that kind of a norm? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. What, you, what we got to do is change the incentive system. If, if you can get away with just telling bold-faced lies and not have any consequences at all, then people are just going to continue to lie. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure whether that involves. I don't. I'm, I'm not optimistic that we're going to be able to, you know, is it, you know, introduce nor new norms to people. But we have to do to change the institutions. I think, in a way that that makes it more likely uh, that people will be punished uh, for for outright lying. So. Um, you know, Republican politicians that tell untruths are going to have to be, you know, sanctioned for ballot boxes. That's not. <laughs> that doesn't give me great hope. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I saw oh, your hand first. Yeah, kind of going off of what he was talking about, is there have been, like, what's the reason for hope for politicians, and I would say of all sides, to uh, embrace a more Machiavellian style of you know, the lies are useful, basically. What would make them embrace that sort of thing? They work. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, they, they work. And, uh, you know, I, I think it all kind of ties together. Um, without a uh, agreed-upon body of knowledge that everybody, you know, kind of trusts in, and, you know, I guess this gets back to the tribal nature of things now. I mean, there's still a significant number of people who believe more people attended 
Donald Trump's inauguration than did Barack Obama's. And so without that, you know, without a body of, of, of knowledge that we all agree upon, including just empirical knowledge, um, then people can draw on these different narratives and create their own you know, sort of dream states almost. Yeah, the woman in the back. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Sarah. Sure. Um, so I have a great uh, faith in education and how that might be able to combat this post-truth era that we're in. However, I struggle with the fact that there is science showing that, well, there's obviously more of this on one side of the aisle than the other. And there is science showing that people on the right tend to have a bigger amygdala, so they respond more to fear, which is obviously more powerful than facts. Um, and it's also been proven in science that they have more of a cognitive rigidity. So I wonder what you think, whether or not education might be able to help this at all. You know, there's some really interesting research being done by Dan Cahane and some of his colleagues that look at the psychology of, of how people come to political choices. And they say, you know, the evidence shows that it isn't how much science you know about, say, climate change. In fact, people who are anti-climate change or, or don't believe in climate change, the more knowledge they have, the more likely they are to cling to their position. In fact, what they do is they go out and find ammunition uh, to combat the ideas that they don't want to agree with. And so it's not a matter, that would be an easy problem to solve, or easier, if it was just a matter of you know, having smarter people. Uh, but what we've done is, is as you point out, that the, the psychology of choice has become, it's not, it's not a matter of what you know, it's who you are. Um, and so you know, there's a whole lot of, you know, as you point out, evidence of, of the psychology here. But let me go over to this side, then I'll come back over here. Yeah. Um, Steve, I, as you know, I share your concerns about out now political lying, but I will defend Sarowitz a little bit here. You know, and uh, I teach in the school of the environment. I wasn't criticizing you. Yeah, I know you were. <laughs> um, but the way I read Sarowitz is that most environmental conflicts are actually value conflicts. Yes. And that science is then simply used as a, as a, as a weapon one way or the other, and, and that if we ignore the value component of environmental conflicts, then uh, we're missing the, 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 the fundamental point. And example I use with my students is the clear-cutting controversies in the 60s and 70s in the, in the U.S. Forest Service. The foresters at the time could say science is on our side, and they would have been right, because the science that was done at the time was the science of production forestry. But scientists today tend to focus on the fragility of ecosystems. When they say that maybe, uh, uh, maybe that's not such a good idea uh, to clear-cut, uh, depending on what you're concerned about, uh, they're also right because they're looking at a different science and so we always have to focus on the questions that a particular scientific enterprise asked and, a, and the questions that it didn't ask before we say well science tells us to do X and that's sort of my message to, to students a lot on, on this issue. Yeah, I mean just to, you know, Sarowitz's conclusion is really uh, you got to deal with the value conflict before science is going to be useful. Yep. And so but that puts us back in the position of, well, how do you do that? Uh, how do you get people to, to come to some consensus on what to do? Uh, when some people believe that it's their God-given right to drive a snowmobile in Yellowstone, uh, environment be damned. Uh, and the other side believes that they should be free to uh, use a pristine, you know, wintertime environment in the Yellowstone. There's just no way to reconcile those. And those are simply value positions. Those are value positions. They're based on two conceptions of freedom, uh, but just different kinds of freedom. So I'll come back to you. Uh, we have a question over here. Yeah. How much of, it, how much of this problem, this may be a simple, really simple question, simplistic question, how much of this problem is the fact that maybe people aren't interested in They're not willing to work to get to the truth. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, historical records of presidents, for example. You could read five different histories of the presidential president's record, and they're all a little different. And so finding the truth takes time. Uh, so maybe we're all looking for the easy way. Well, certainly, you know, um, thank you for the question. Um, you know, certainly, 
uh, if you want to look at the optimistic side, say, of the, of the debate about civil discourse, and people like Murs Fiorino say it's not that big a problem because there's only a tiny, tiny fraction of the people who are really interested enough in politics to argue about it. You know, and he points out that, you know, even the highest rated Fox TV show only, you know, has, only gets 1.5% of the U.S. population. And so there may be something to that, that only people in, in, this, in this room, in this environment, are really interested in engaging these issues. Otherwise, you know, you might just be willing to take your cues uh, from whatever opinion leader uh, you happen to stumble upon or, or somebody that, you know, your neighbor agrees with. Uh, I, that certainly, that's certainly a very strong possibility. Okay. Come here and then, Joe, you have a question too. So, <coughs> what, is, what, what has been the push for academics to try and develop a search for truth, or in, to instill in our students? Uh, what policies are being developed? Has, is, there, is there anything that's been done very broad? Is it just up to each individual university? What's your take on this? What? Um, <laughs> I, I know what I've done in my classroom right, in right. the past, um, you know, to have people, have students think critically. But on a broader context, it seems to be now a more serious issue. Um, obviously, you've, you've come a long way here to address this. Right. Has there any, any talk in the higher levels of any policy administrators and universities to? To I think about? Maybe you should ask my dean. So it's up to us individual I, academics? Well, I think, I think what I, the, 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 my, my, my sort of gut reaction is that, you know, for those of us who are in, in the academy, peer review is, is sort of the gold standard. And so that's how we try to ensure that what we're doing is, is, is close to the truth as we can possibly get. Um, I don't know that universities really need to do that. It's sort of a norm <coughs> that we develop in our training, I think. Actually, Steven Pinker in his book talks a lot about critical thought curricula that are being developed. And you know, the original exper experience with them were, wasn't very good, but they've really perfected them now and gotten a lot better uh, in, in terms of how we help students start to think critically about facts. And, and so there are, there are real efforts in this. <laughs> but that doesn't mean they can't come here. Yeah. I was just just some examples. I think just on this campus, the Common Reading Program, mm -hmm. I think, is one of those was intended to to try to create some background knowledge then that people across the campus could discuss. And I think there are certainly other aspects of that on campus itself. So. Don't think they work necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just going to follow up on a point that the young woman made back there about, uh, you know, there is a tendency to sometimes accuse people of a certain level of ignorance in terms of debate. But like he said, they, you know, another that not genuinely the case, and, and the point you made is exactly right that sometimes the more educated somebody is, the more likely they are to stick with their denialism because they have sophisticated arguments actually in support of that. Mm -hmm. But one key is uh, issues of trust. So there's a big difference between um, who the left trusts that put their trust in uh, people in the academy and who the right uh, trusts that they tend to put their, the deniers uh, tend to put their trust in so-called merchants of doubt, uh, people who challenge the academy in fact too. And then the other thing too is I, I think more than uh, issues of uh, truth, I think a lot of the contemporary problem, or, you know, talking back and, and forth, uh, comes with differences in rhetorical style or, or uh, um, rhetoric in general. And this goes back to the origins of Western philosophy, right? I mean, the, the term sophistry comes from the sophists, <laughs> um, who, uh, you know, I, I teach fallacies in my logic class, and some people <coughs> use them as argumentative moves. <laughs> so um, so there are kind of differences in, in trust and differences in uh, patterns of rhetoric um, that make it very difficult, actually, to reach some kind of consensus. Is there a question over there? Um, so one of the points that you made that I thought was especially interesting was that 
when public safety or public health comes into a factor, that's something that really catches people's eyes. But then some of the things that we're like having controversy over is like global warming, like water levels rising. When when water levels rises, it some people's houses are going to be underwater, or like with some of these wildfires, like people's houses are literally on fire. Why is why are those issues? Why don't those catch people's attention's eyes? But then something like the ozone with um, skin cancer, why does that catch other people's eyes? Well, first of all, skin cancer is a very personal, you know, sort of thing. You know, what's happening in the wildfires in California? I mean, we feel bad for them, and if we have family members down there that are being displaced or otherwise harmed, that's bad. But if you think of it from a personal perspective, you know, I don't live in an urban wildfire corridor. Uh, in terms of global climate change, you know, that's a classic example of the harms are off in the future, and they're likely to happen to somebody else, or we don't think they're going to happen to us. And so, I mean, it's the same reason that people can live in California on top of an earthquake fault. You know, they, they discount uh, a very real risk in a way that is maybe harmful to them. Or people living in Florida, you know, you know, they know there's going to be a hurricane. Um, and so people aren't very good at figuring out risk. But there, there is some evidence, though, that if you, if you I, I mentioned the, the phrase um, 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 policy image earlier, uh, if you frame issues in terms of public health, in terms of national security, or in terms of economics, uh, those are the frames that are more likely to resonate with people, because those are things that are, you know, sort of hot button issues you know, for folks. Yeah. So, what, uh, in your educated opinion, <laughs> what are the top steps we can take individually to mitigate false information in our personal lives as we come across it in social media and news and other things. Well, I guess try to try to argue that, that, that you know and, and provide evidence uh, that your position uh, actually does have some foundation in, in what we might call truth. Uh, you know, part of the problem is you know as Karl Popper you know told us long ago, you know we can't prove anything. Uh, we have to just wait until we can disprove something, and so that puts science a little bit at a disadvantage because we can never say you know the sun's going to come up in the east tomorrow with 100 percent certainty uh, even though we're fairly sh sure it's going to happen uh, so i guess at an individual level you just have to keep you know fighting the good fight I suppose. yes sir um what would you say is the logical extreme uh to a post truth uh, politics where people more subscribe to the idea of um, I forget who said it, but there is no good or bad, but thinking makes it so, but more so related to truth. What's the logical extension? Yeah. Um, I suppose just a complete abandonment. I think I made a, a case that we're not probably going to willing to do that, given our reliance on technology and expertise and so forth. Um, you know, it's, it, it's largely, in my view, sort of a, more of a rhetorical uh, exercise. It has real, real implications. You know, when you have uh, people, elected officials, you know, telling obvious untruths, um, as I said, that's not good. There's, there's, there's harms that come out of that for civil discourse, for trust in institutions, you know, for just the general tenor of, of politics. Um, so I guess what you're asking is, can we sink any lower? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, as one of my mentors once said, I don't like to make predictions, particularly about the future. Uh, so <laughs> I'll just leave it, leave it at that, I guess. Yes. Hi. Um, I thought it was really interesting when you said that opinions are um, whereas factual, reliable news... At least on TV. Yeah, at least <laughs> on, well, on Facebook, probably, too. Yeah, well, sure. And how, like, even yourself, as someone who has a PhD, it's hard for you to decipher that as well. Um, and I'm just curious what you think about um, poor, lower-income neighborhoods that don't have a lot of funding towards their schoolings. Um, maybe those people having a harder um, ability to also tell the difference between an opinion and a fact. And if we move towards a more truthful society or if we move more towards uh, fact-checking and then demonizing those, we're not able to so easily fact-check. Is that going to polarize our political society even more for those who don't have the ability or the means to access news that's factual? You know, that's an, that's an interesting question. And, and, you know, as I've gotten older, when I was younger in graduate school, um, I used to thought I had a corner on, on what the truth is and what's right and what people should think. Uh, I've, I've completely abandoned that idea. Uh, who am I to tell somebody what they should believe? Now I can try to argue with them, 
uh, about you know about their factual position. Um, but I'm certainly not going to put myself in a position where I'm going to tell somebody, you know, you've got to believe what I believe because I know what's right. Um, if you want to believe that, you know, we didn't evolve from apes, uh, I'll argue with you about it. But you know, at the end of the day, you're probably not going to you're probably not going to abandon that uh, abandon that idea. And, and uh, what does it does it increasingly polarize us? I think sure. I mean, it contributes to polarization in the way that. We, you know, just the way that we cognitively deal with uh, our, our, not just our political world, but our social world. Um, I mean, there's lots and lots of evidence, not just from political science, uh, that we're polarized. In fact, we're sorting each other into communities on the basis of our belief systems. Uh, and, uh, you know, who we would allow our, our son or daughter to marry. You know, back in the 50s, it didn't matter at all whether somebody was a Democrat or Republican. Now, 55% of Republicans say they wouldn't want their son or daughter to marry the Democrat, and vice versa. And so, yeah, I think it, it certainly has, has an impact on, on how, how homogenous we are in society. So, so I said that, so there is, you know, we know from this psychological and cognitive sciences that we're all susceptible to our individual biases in, in evaluating information. Um, but the key is to construct institutions that allow us collectively to get at fact-based policies, right? So this is where institutions become so important. And so we, we know how institutions operate in different arenas, like for instance in science, you know, uh, blind peer review, uh, or in, um, in in the academy, you know, we, we have blind peer review processes in science, you have, you know, study, you know, double blind studies and things like that. So we need those types of institutions in our politics as well. We need institutions that allow us to collectively get at fact-based decisions and weed out or filter out our, our individual level biases, right? So, so one of the things that concerns me, for instance, if you look at what's going on in Congress today, is many of the institutions that used to protect that kind of collective fact-based decision-making, the idea you empower the minority to, to have uh, some role in the hearings and and make decisions about who gets to come and testify. Uh, the idea that you know you, you don't you know ram things through on part straight party line votes. You know filibusters. I know they have a, their own problems, but but the erosion of those types of institutions then s make us less susceptible to making fact based decisions, right? Yeah, no, I, I completely so, agree. I mean, there's there's actually evidence that bipartisan bills are generally uh, better constructed because they they tend to weed out the bad ideas of the majority and, in, and inject the you know, some of the better ideas, you get more towards a middle ground as opposed to one extreme or the other. And so certainly, I, mean, I think that's, that, that's true. The question again is, you know, how do you make that happen in an environment where you know, there's this extreme polarization? You know, having said that, I mean, there are some things that Congress has acted on in a bipartisan way. I mean, like opioid uh, uh, bill, uh, there was a bipartisan review, but they still come to some decisions, mostly on pork barrel projects. That, but, uh, but there is some agreement on, on those areas. It's the, you know, it's the atmospherics, the thing that we see at the, on the top of the fold of the New York Times that catch our attention in the immigration debate, gun control, abortion, you know, caravans in Kavanaugh, things like that, uh, that get our attention. Yes? Yeah. So uh, what effect do you think the form of media people are consuming uh, has on this whole fake news debate, like first thing? Social media and cable news versus like Marvel Ford debates and TED Talks. Yeah, this that's really not my area. I wish Travis Rudolph were here. Or that's his that's his expert area of expertise. Uh, but what I've what I've seen is that uh, particularly among millennials, uh, overwhelming percentages, something like seventy five percent, get all of their news from social media, from Instagram, from Facebook, from Twitter, or whatever else. You know, right? But what you're hearing there is the echo chamber. Because the people you're gonna be paying attention to and there's a logarithms on Facebook apparently that feed you things that you've touched on in the past, and so it just becomes a, a never-ending cycle of, of affirmation for you. Uh, and so it, uh, it certainly is a, it certainly is a helping helping problem. Yeah. I, I wanted to try and follow up on something Cornell said, and the question is asked back here about the university, and so the university is one of those institutions that should provide an open exchange ideas and the bad ideas should be weeded out. Um, a couple of years ago when, when we had the presidential election, there was shock felt across campuses because no one thought 
that Trump could be elected. We've created in our academies, I think, institutions that lean in a particular direction, right? And that and that that blinded us to the realities of what might happen, right, in the political sphere. What do we do as institutions to ensure that our own biases aren't growing in one direction versus another? How do we ensure that the open debate on campus really is open? Well, I think the Foley Institute is, is an exemplar by bringing I agree. In, <laughs> <laughs> as, as, the old, as the old football coach, you can have that. As the old football coach at Texas used to say, you got to dance with who brung you. Uh, so, and, uh, yeah, I think, I think, I mean this and sincerely, the Foley Institute brings in people, um, not with just one perspective. I mean, there's lots of ways that you can be inclusive uh, of different ideas. I mean, it's not just a diversity of political opinions, but diversity of ideas in general. And so I think, I don't know, university, most parts of universities do a pretty good job, and the Foley Institute in particular. Does, does a good job of that. Got time for probably one more question. Yeah. Um, Steve, you, you, because you mentioned wildfire a, a couple mm -hmm. times, I've been working on this um, this problem for 25 mm -hmm. years. And I wrote a paper a number of years ago that suggested that wildfire is a wicked problem in the sense that perfectly reasonable people can construct different explanations for what happened in California okay. last week. And they wouldn't be wrong. <coughs> they would they would simply be looking at one part of the right. blind man and the elephant, mm -hmm. right? So one of the real dilemmas we face, and I think the academy has to really tackle this, is when problems like that are wicked, we have to understand that, that we can make perfectly valid arguments that it's a case of this, but someone else can make a perfectly valid argument that it's a case of that. And and people's politics then tend to for example, the environmental community wants to focus on climate change, or the forestry community wants to focus on vegetative conditions. And, and so I think we, the academy, need to try to help sort those problems out and point out that each side has a point. Well, I think, I think that's, a, that, that's a, a good point, and, and I think that's why increasingly universities, at least Washington State University and more of others, are going more towards interdisciplinary uh, sorts of approaches to problems. Uh, because you know, we can't just look at a, a wildfire problem from one perspective, uh, for the same reasons that Sarowitz would say. Um, that's why NSF and other large funding organizations uh, increasingly are going towards you know, these large multi-year, multidisciplinary uh, sort of approaches. Okay, well I think our time is up. Before I ask you and, and join me in thanking Stephen for a great uh, conversation, let me remind you again, our next event after the break is on the 29th at, the, at 3 p.m. We have Bob Ferguson coming to speak, so I encourage you to come to that. Let me uh, wish you all a happy Thanksgiving now and hope to see you after the break. Join me now in taking Stephen for a